Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muqtadar Khan, your host. And today we have with us a very distinguished uh, Foreign Service Officer, uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed, who is also a scholar. Uh, he, he served in the Indian Foreign Service since 1974. He was ambassador twice to Saudi Arabia, to the United Arab Emirates. He was also served in Yemen and Oman. He is also a fellow with the ORF Foundation, a very prominent think tank in DC, and he is uh, he holds the Ram Sate chair at the Symbiosis International University. He has written several books since retirement. Uh, this is his latest book, uh, West Asia at War. In fact, this semester, I'm using two of your chapters, uh, one on uh, India's relations with West Asia and the other one uh, on U.S. foreign policy towards Israel and Iran uh, in, in my uh, classes this semester. Uh, so we are very fortunate to have Ambassador uh, Talmiz Ahmed with us. But today we are going to talk about a book, the, an e-book that I just edited called The Rise of India as a World Power, in which he contributed a chapter that essentially looks at, uh, in a very comprehensive way, uh, India's relations uh, with the West Asia, we call it the Middle East from this side of the world, uh, in which he not only talks about how India's relations with West Asia has evolved, uh, but he also talks about how certain changes in the India's domestic culture and politics could impact India's relations with West Asia. I'm going to post uh, links to the book, uh, to the PDF of the book, as well as to the ambassador's chapter right below in the description in the video. Uh, and this book is free, thanks to New Lines Institute, which has sponsored and published uh, this book. So you can download it uh, and, uh, and read it. It's very thought provoking and extremely informative. Uh, and uh, before we begin, uh, you have to do the needful, which is subscribe uh, to the channel, like the video, press the bell icon. And those of you who want to support Conversations can join it and become a member of Conversations. So Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed, welcome to Conversations. Thank you very much. Sir, I want to thank you for your incredible service. Uh, you were serving in the Middle East during extremely post 9-11 and during the era of the so-called global war on terror. And I remember how difficult times and how uh, critical diplomacy was uh, during those days. So I want to first talk a little bit about your chapter and then talk a little bit about India's relations with the Middle East, uh, broadly speaking. In your chapter, you basically make the point that India at the moment is having uh, very positive relations with countries in West Asia, especially United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, and perhaps even Egypt to some extent. But you also hint that these relations are mostly transactional. Even though that there are such old civilizational and cultural ties in this religion, the, the relationship seems to be based more on transactions. What can you do for me? What can I do for you? Uh, so if you can uh, briefly sum up for us, like, where do you see India's relations with uh, West Asia at the moment, especially uh, given the rising tensions between India and China and uh, also the domestic politics in India? India's approach to West Asia, I have described as being bilateral and transactional in that India refuses to see the region in terms of a collective identity. India has engagements with individual countries, Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Israel, Qatar, etc. Each relationship is valuable in terms of its own merits. And therefore, it is, I call it a transactional relationship. It is also bilateral in terms of the fact that our ties with Iran do not impinge on our ties with Saudi Arabia or with Israel. Each relationship is separate. I used to say, I believe that this made sense during the period when the United States dominated the region. It was the hegemonic power in the region and did not permit any other role player in the region. I had sense from 2010 onwards a degree of fatigue in the United States with regard to the region and a kind of reluctance to play the role of a security guarantor. And I had felt at that time 
that as the United States recedes from the region, there is now scope for new role players to promote stability and peace in the region. And I had identified India as the principal role player in this regard. But where I went wrong was that India refuses to see the region in terms of a collective identity. If you wish to play a strategic role in the region, <coughs> you have to see the region as a whole. You cannot have transactional relations. You should be engaged deeply with the dynamics of the region, with the security concerns of the various role players. You have to be engaged on a long-term basis. You must have a degree of patience because countries are have been estranged for a long period. I felt that India was well-placed in this regard because we enjoyed a very high degree of credibility in the region. Everyone knew that India is non-intrusive, non-prescriptive, and non-hegemonic. India, they knew for several thousand years, and they were familiar with our community. They dealt with us. We had constantly refreshed our relationship and made it relevant to the times. Once the oil revenues had flowed in, we, were, we started providing human resources, and that evolved over time, and today we are business partners and technological partners. So, but all of that, including the initiatives taken by Prime Minister Modi, I personally feel have corporatized India's ties with the region in the sense that the political initiative of engagement really opened the door for the Indian corporate sector to step in rather than for India to play a role of strategic importance and value in the region. Sir, you, you talk about bilateral relationships as if that we don't live in an uh, interdependent world. So, for example, I can understand that Israel will not be upset if India's uh, exports of rice and aloo and tomato to Iran went from five tons to 500 tons. But if India wanted to send 50 Tejas to Iran, suddenly Israel would definitely be upset and India cannot ask Israeli Navy boats to uh, to basically, you know, land in Shabahar uh, port where India is in port. So in order to maintain that kind of bilateral relations where relations with A do not impact relations with B, so we can have relations with both A and B, it is necessarily limited, isn't it? No. I The, the role I had envisaged for India, the strategic role that I envisaged for India was entirely diplomatic. I saw no role for military presence in the region because the Americans are already there. Yeah. What I felt was that with the kind of goodwill that India enjoys in the region, India can work with the various powers that are estranged from each other. And I had in mind at that time, Saudi Arabia and Iran, the very role that China played. When I first thought about this and I promoted it with friends in China, Japan and Korea, which was my first coalition, they said, we are fine. We support you. We also have crucial uh, relations with this region. But you are you know this region for 5,000 years. The Chinese colleague told me at that time in 2011, 2012, that you've been here 5,000 years. We've been here five years. You take the lead and we will follow. But what I found, I wrote papers in this regard. I also agitated this issue in the councils of government, though I had retired. But there was no interest. And then I took a lot of uh, joy when Prime Minister Modi started going. And when you look at the joint statements, all of them speak of strategic partnership, strategic role, promotion of peace and security, promotion of stability regionally. If you look at the documents, they don't talk of bilateral relations at all. They talk of regional peace and stability and a strategic role in that regard. And picking up on these joint statements, I then wrote academic papers saying that this is what India could do. I changed our coalition partners depending on who wishes to come in. But the lead role, I believe, belonged to India. You know, I, I travel quite a lot through Middle East and uh, been to nearly every country in the region. And uh, what was interesting was that while... The fact that I'm an American 
open every door that I wanted to open. So uh, if I call uh, the Egyptian Council on World Affairs in Cairo and say I want to give a talk, no problem. They would immediately <laughs> arrange it for me. So being an American gave me a lot of influence and access to universities and everything. But I noticed something else that even though I got access, there was always suspicion about Americans. But the moment they would find that I'm from India, they would immediately start respecting me. So I was Absolutely. having, so I was having the best of both the worlds. As an American, <laughs> I got access. As an Indian, uh, and I'm in Asal still Hind, and they would be like, "Oh, so thrilled yeah. that, they, oh my God!" And I noticed that there was a lot of soft power. You know, cab drivers in Egypt would harass me with showless dialogues. I mean, can you imagine taking a cab anywhere in the Middle East and everybody is spouting uh, Bollywood <laughs> dialogues or even trying to Absolutely. sing songs to you? Absolutely. But lately, given the, the changing uh, approach that India has towards Israel, for example, with now with uh, I2U2, we see strategic partnerships. Uh, uh, is, it India, is India in the danger of losing the soft power that it enjoys among the population of the Middle East uh, or West Asia, while continuing to have strategic relations with the with the rulers of West Asia, given the fact that there are absolutely no democracies. And so, so the rulers can often act uh, independent of the public opinion in their country to some extent. Affinity with India, affection with India, and a sense of knowledge of India is very deeply ingrained in the Iranian, Arab, and Israeli psyche. It is not going to be damaged by one or two episodes or something uh, changing. I don't think that there is any concern. For example, we opened relations with Israel in 1991. Mm -hmm. And from that day till today, I have never heard a single official or individual complaining to me about this relationship. Never. Because they recognize the fact that India's relations with the Arab world are very, very deep. Diplomacy is different. Uh, in fact, there was, uh, uh, at that time, Mr. Yasser Arafat told our Prime Minister that it is good for us that you have opened this relationship because you can carry our cause, the message relating to our cause, right into the heart of the Israeli establishment. Whether we did or not is another matter. The fact is that India is very highly cherished and very deeply admired at the popular level. And of course, because of the economic potential, even the leaderships and the business communities are reaching out to India. Where India seems to have drawn the line is that it does not wish to play a strategic role in the region. We seem to have abdicated that space to China. But look at even this I2U. I to you too, I, I have never been a great admirer of this. I have argued that just because you have a catchy abbreviation, it doesn't mean you have an alignment. The joint statements of the I to you two only refer to the opening the doors to the corporate sector. It affirms to me that India's approach, diplomatic approach to West Asia is for the government to facilitate economic exchanges so that the corporate sector in India can benefit from this. And this is what has happened. Today, you have read that Larson and Tubro has got a $4 billion contract. You have seen various other companies getting in. You have also seen various companies from the region trying to come into India. So this is where we are. What I would say to you, and it's a matter of deep personal regret, that the kind of role we should have played and were well equipped to play that role we have never seen, we have never taken seriously and certainly we are not doing anything about it now. So if you look at India, say in the 1990s, etc., India was not in that kind of a position of strength that India is today as the fifth biggest, soon to be the third biggest economy, a major uh, military procurement uh, uh, source. Uh, we, are, we have a huge military in India now. So India is definitely a powerful player, but, but it appears that you're trying to say that while India is focused on geoeconomics in the Middle East, 
uh, in West Asia, it is not interested in geopolitics. And that's why it's countries like uh, Iran, uh, China are able to negotiate uh, some kind of uh, peace uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And You're absolutely right. You see, China from the beginning has taken a regional approach to its diplomacy. Uh, you will recall here the Belt and Road Initiative. Yes, It is a regional enterprise. It has a regional vision and it keeps on expanding. When Xi Jinping came to the region in 2016, he set up a China-Arab dialogue. When Xi Jinping came again uh, in December 2022 to Riyadh, he looked at the region as a whole. He engaged with Saudi Arabia bilaterally. He engaged with the leaders of the GCC and he engaged with the leaders of the Arab League. No Indian leader has ever addressed a conclave of the GCC or of the Arab League. Because we don't look at the region collectively and we do not envisage for ourselves a role that would be of a strategic character. This is the difference between India and China. Therefore, China, which is a very recent arrival in the region and has far less of an appeal as far as soft power is concerned, has positioned itself as a player, <coughs> as a player in the strategic context of this. Yes, so, you know, I remember the, the December, I did a conversation on Xi Jinping's visit to Saudi Arabia, you know, on one day he met all the Arab leaders, then he met GCC separately, and then he had yes. a bilateral meeting with uh, I, I don't know whether you saw Prime Minister Modi's speech uh, in Bali last year at G20. It was a, a reasonably good speech, and I was quite impressed with the speech. But it was very interesting to see when he talked about cultural similarities he spoke for about an hour to, to the public of Bali. I'm not talking about his uh, G20 speech. I'm talking about his outreach to that. And it was amazing. He, he was talking to a country which is the biggest Muslim country in population. Uh, there is so much of commonality of Islam between uh, India and Indonesia. And the Indian Islam and Indonesian Islam is infused by Indian values. He had nothing to say about Islam in Indonesia or the fact that we, we are the only three, we are two of the three countries with 200 million Muslims. He had nothing to say. He just talked about how in Bali Vishnu was worshipped and so was it in India. And so he just talked about Hindu values. So when I look at this approach, whether it is towards uh, West Asia with, with Saudi Arabia, UAE, or towards East Asia with Malaysia and Indonesia, India is not leveraging its Islamic heritage uh, and its uh, affinity. There are many Indian scholars uh, from the past who are highly respected uh, in, in, in the Middle East as well as in Asia. I remember uh, going to an event in Turkey and, and, and a very important Sufi sheikh got up and met with me in front of like 10,000 people and kept saying, you're from the land of Rabbani, Rabbani. And he kept, you know, giving me a lot of respect. At that time, I didn't realize that uh, Sir Hindi in, in, in India is called Rabbani in Turkey. That is his first name. So why are we missing this opportunity to leverage this cultural and civilizational potential, which can bring... Um, India closer to several East Asians and several West Asian countries. You see, this is connected with the fundamental agenda of the government of India, led by Prime Minister Modi, and that is to highlight India's Hindu tradition, to look at the Islamic and uh, its Islamic period as a period of slavery perhaps worse than the British period. Therefore, you will find part of their discourse is to refer to 1,000 years of slavery. They, the agenda does not include the celebration of India's Islamic heritage. On the contrary, step by step, this heritage is being removed from the public space. Names are being changed of various institutions, of various uh, railway stations, 
various cities, various. So you find that the, you have to, to get the answer to your question, you have to see the motivation behind the government, the, the, the engine behind the government. And that is intensely ideological. It is intensely communal. It not only seeks to erase the Islamic heritage of our country, it also demonizes the Muslim community at present as the other. And therefore, you not only have a, a kind of condemnation of the past, you also have an abuse of the present. At the present. And yep. that is where you are. When the Prime Minister spoke in Southeast Asia, he is referring entirely to the, to the Hindu contribution, the contribution of the Hindu culture to that region, even in Indonesia. In fact, many Indians are very proud of the fact that many names in Indonesia of Muslims come from Sanskrit originally yeah. or from other Indian languages. And of course, it is obviously uh, the case in the case, uh, in uh, in say Thailand, where again you have this. It's a celebration of a much earlier heritage, the Hindu heritage, and the agenda is overwhelmingly domestic. The Prime Minister, when he went to the UAE, actually visited a mosque, the Sheikh Zayed Mosque, and was photographed there. He has never visited a mosque in India has never embraced an Indian in India, uh, an, an Indian Muslim in India. So let us be very clear here. And I have made this point in my article uh, very clearly that we have to note this fact. The government is not camouflaging. It's not hiding it. It's a very overt presence and presentation. There is a systematic erasure of the Muslim heritage of our country and a systematic abuse of the Muslims and demonization of Muslims as the other, and so that your identity, I find this very ironical, that with all the cultural strength, and with all the heritage, religious and political and cultural, that we have from our Hindu heritage, the present-day communalists find it possible to define themselves only in terms of abusing the Muslims. I find that same. I also pointed out to somebody recently that people like me who are Muslim have never felt the need to abuse somebody else, to define ourselves. So what is missing here, I ask? Is it a sense of self absence of self-confidence? That why no Muslim has threatened, you will never find a Muslim abusing someone else's faith, someone else's heritage. In fact, it's very deep in our DNA, very deep in our psyche that we are an integral part of a very long heritage that, predis that predates the arrival of Muslims. And indeed, as you know well, overwhelmingly, possibly 80 or 90 percent of present day Muslims were actually converted to Islam only in the last 200 and odd years. We are not of foreign origin. Our faith is also not of foreign origin in the sense that every mohalla in India, every neighborhood in India has a peer, has a local saint, venerated by everybody, by the entire community. You see in, say, Ajmer, if you go to Ajmer Sharif, at least half the people there are not Muslim. It's not a Muslim shrine. It is an Indian shrine. And I point out to people, when Mr. Veer Savarkar said that an Indian Muslim can never be loyal to his country because when he prays, he directs himself to Mecca. I said, no, that is true. But look at the culture. Look at the heritage. It is Sufic. Every part of India has a Sufic shrine. And that is venerated more because most of our people cannot go to Mecca. They come to Nizamuddin Aliya. They come to Ajmer Sharif. And they don't even have to come to these major shrines. Every part of India has a shrine. You know, I had a very interesting uh, conversation with William Dalrymple about his book, The Anarchy, and in which uh, he, you know, in, 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 he does make the point that people don't realize that uh, Islam actually spread in the 18th century, mostly in India, and not during the period of the conquest, etc. And a lot of it is essentially because of Sufis. But I do want to 
uh, point out to you another interesting development, like when India was hosting the SCO summit, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization this year, one of the goals of uh, the Indian presidency of SCO was to highlight the Buddhist uh, tradition. Now, I find it ironic that SEO is composed of the five stands, which are all Muslim majority countries to the extent that they are more than 90% Muslim. Uh, Buddhists are less than 1% in that whole region. The only country that is, uh, which has a significant Buddhist population in SEO is China, not even India. India doesn't even have a significant Hindu, uh, Buddhist population as compared to China. And so India is emphasizing its Buddhist tradition, strengthening China's soft power in Central Asia or on these grounds, and ignoring the fact that India has more Muslims than the entire Central Asia put together. So there are 80 million there, there are 200 million in India. And the new members of, uh, of whether it is BRICS, whether it is SEO, or all Muslim countries, Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE. So, so the question that rises, yeah. how long does India think that it can demonize Muslims as less than human. Uh, and the kind of comments I get, sometimes you will be surprised uh, that the dehumanization of Muslims seems to have become a popular effect. And people from India, millions of them who work in the Middle East, do they go there thinking very lowly about Islam and Muslims? How long can this continue where you demonize Muslims and Islam and then try to have good relations with one fourth of the world, which is Islamic and Muslim, over 55 countries? Overwhelmingly, the average Indian, regardless of his social status, sees himself as a product of an eclectic culture, a culture that is diverse, a culture that is uh, that has enriched us. I do not believe that the overwhelming majority of Indians have communal feelings. They may be, there is a kind of atmosphere created in the country to demonize a particular community. By the way, it is not just Muslims. They also demonize other minorities. And the biggest problem we are facing today in terms of the confrontation with the Indian state is not from Muslims and Christians. It is from Sikhs, <laughs> sections of the Sikh community. Yeah. And then if you look at uh, certain other issues which are of very serious concern to us, say Manipur, Muslims are not involved with the Manipur issue. So right. you will see that demonizing a particular community does not solve any of your problems. I would say to you that India can, in that is that an accommodative order that respects the diversity of our country is not a choice. It is not an, It was not a choice in 1947, traumatized by the partition of India and still having 60, 70 million Muslims at home who overwhelmingly did not migrate. They did not believe in migration. They felt that their, their life is here. The people who migrated, do recall here, were overwhelmingly from states that were at that time partition, and that was Bengal and Punjab. It was not a migration. It, uh, it, was, it was not voluntary. They had to flee because of the law and order issue. The total number of Muslims who quote-unquote migrated to Pakistan for economic reasons after partition, after independence, would be counted as a million or two. And overwhelmingly, the mainstream of the Indian Muslim community stayed at home. Now, look at the heritage. We had 800 years of Muslim rule, diverse at different times, at different parts. We do not have evidence that the mass conversion of the community that these rulers ruled was a very great priority. Overwhelmingly, the people who have uh, converted are at the fringe areas. And Richard Eaton has pointed out that their own traditional faith was fragile and they welcomed the faith of a single God. Otherwise, you don't have, at the time of partition of our country, the total number of Muslims in India was 25%. After 800 years of Muslim rule, what does this tell you? You see, most of the Indian rulers never bothered about the faith of anybody. They, they had rules, they had certain norms, 
they were they would not tolerate rebellion that is a mad pattern all over the world but otherwise they didn't bother with your individual faith they didn't intrude into your personal life which is why the caste system remained intact what you do see in india is the the role of the sufi saints who came from iran and from central asia to india and with their simple life they appeal to the community and who are the overwhelming majority of those who converted the people from our depressed classes people who as a result of the indian caste system saw a salvation for themselves outside the hindu fold whether they obtained it or not is a matter of debate and the record is mixed in that regard my own family converted 250 years ago from a family of kayas one individual left the family we suspect because of some sufi influence he took his inheritance and set up three villages in western up they are there to this day they have never had communal tension the community is equally divided between hindus and muslims there is a very traditional uh, brahmin family who conduct the temple worship there is a very prominent rajput family who are also land owners in that village so we have a very long tradition and i think it is very deep in us i am not pessimistic i do not believe it is look at the uh, agenda for example which is the biggest problem in our country it's not hindu versus muslim it is a caste system the maximum atrocity is that hindus have uh, suffered is from people from the upper caste not from muslims yeah uh, sir you have served as ambassador to saudi arabia twice and you have even received uh, the king abdul aziz award from them for great service uh, to india you, uh, saudi relations and so i want to turn a little bit towards saudi arabia given that uh, crown prince mohammed bin salman is uh, staying over after g20 for, uh, for a state visit for one more day uh, can you make sense of uh, what his grand strategy has been because saudi arabia has been making a lot of diplomatic overtures <laughs> initiatives in the past one year uh, signing uh, some kind of a rapprochement with I- iran in beijing uh, you know, there is a lot of mutual investments between uh, saudi arabia and, and china uh, also this uh, uh, agreement to perhaps de-dollarize uh, the oil trade between china and uh, Saudi Arabia, and then it turns uh, and uh, makes this uh, offer basically to the Biden administration that if it is given peaceful nuclear technology and guarantees the kind of guarantee that the U.S. is not ready even to give to Israel or Ukraine, uh, security guarantees, then it will join the Abrahamic Accords. So, so how do you make sense of what is the the new vision of Saudi foreign policy? Uh, the crown prince who is also now the prime minister of the country has a two part agenda one part is to consolidate his rule and gain credibility and legitimacy this he has done on the basis of relaxing many of the social norms that used to define the kingdom over the last century and has particularly appealed to young people and by getting rid of these very onerous uh, restrictions that you had and which were unique to the kingdom which were touted as islamic but really were unique to the kingdom and possibly a product of its own unique heritage particularly the affiliation between the royal family and the doctrine of wahhabia that is he has addressed that frontally he has taken away very recently the islamic identity that used to be the most important or prominent aspect of national identity uh, and of course the narrative that supported it the covenant between the ali saud uh, in 1744 and mohammed ibn uh, and sheikh mohammed ibn abdul wahhab the covenant where the the royal family and the cleric came together to define and shape a politico religious politico state that continue he has got rid of that he has announced that the state should be dated from the period 17 years 27 years before 1744 that is from 1717 when muhammad ali saud 
took over uh, the leadership of the Ali Saud family. So that is the most important development that has occurred. Also, there is a symbol that has been created and that symbol has no reference to Islam whatsoever. The second part, now whether he is successful in this or not, we will know over time. But my own impression is that certainly young people suddenly feel a sense of freedom. His message to them is a very exciting message. Don't look for employment. Become my partner in this great enterprise uh, of our nation where we will be a technological hub, we will be a logistical hub, we will be a trading hub for all the region and, for, and we will be major role players in world affairs. In foreign policy from 2020, he has shrugged off the American yoke and you find now he is asserting strategic autonomy. In strategic, in terms of strategic autonomy, he believes that he would that that is a very significant development in that the U.S., which used to dominate and control every aspect of Saudi foreign policy and security policy, is now no longer the principal player. Saudi, I would call it a coming of age. Saudi Arabia has built very substantial ties with Russia and with China and with other Eastern countries like India. So it has now become a, made, a role player, but its role is defined by its adherence to strategic autonomy in a multipolar order. With regard to the United States insisting on normalization with Israel, it is a very misconceived approach because the United States is pushing so hard on this, desperate for some kind of achievement in the dying days of the Biden administration with nothing to show for the, the period up to now. In this background, they want to, to show that they have normalized. Normalized with whom? Look at the government in Israel. The most extreme right-wing government, totally insensitive to the region, totally insensitive to the Palestinian community, very often bent on even desecrating the Al-Aqsa Mosque. How do you persuade Saudi Arabia to normalize relations? Is the, the same pressure that the U.S. is has been putting upon the kingdom? I ask a simple question: Why don't you pressurize the Israelis? I never see any evidence of you agitating in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem about some kind of uh, of some kind of uh, of concession that could be shown as a, that there is now. A, a ground prepared, mm -hmm. there could be finally some kind of uh, of agreement, a kind of normalization. I think it should not be ruled out. If not tomorrow, maybe within a few, within a short period of time. The thing that you have, uh, what they said, this is the world, uh, the uh, the Wall Street Journal article that the Saudis said that you must give us civilian nuclear uh, capability, no. uh, and you must also sign a defense agreement. I am told that both these conditions were found extremely onerous in Washington so and totally want, opposed. They no, don't want they to were. give either of them. They, they, they want yeah, to. they don't want to give any of them. And yeah. it is very robustly opposed in, uh, in Israel. So where are we going? What are we talking about? So much noise, sound and fury signifying nothing. I, I have a feeling that perhaps it's a very smart diplomatic uh, gambit by uh, the crown prince by saying, look, give me something and this is what I want. And uh, uh, I hope he doesn't back off on something silly like, you know, OK, we will open a university in Riyadh or something like that instead of those first two. But uh, if if he can get those two things that he's asking for, especially uh, on, uh, on the issue of... Uh, uh, nuclear technology, civilian, as well as uh, uh, security guarantees, uh, then it is, I think, a, a good deal for Saudi Arabia. Uh, sir, um, th this is my last question to you. No, uh, if I may comment sure, sure, very sure. quickly. No guarantee from the United States has any value or validity. Because, because is, you have, you keep on changing, you have elections every two years and you have a presidential election every four years. The new president's full-time job in his first year or possibly second year 
is to ensure that he overturns the legacy of his predecessor. You have no continuity. I, I would be very shocked if anybody in Riyadh believed that Biden, a lame duck president, with nothing to show in his presidency, now in the dying days of his presidency, can guarantee anything. What no. are we talking about? That's nonsense. No. No. So I don't believe that has got yeah. any value or validity. You cannot get... And then you talk of security guarantee. Which security guarantee is the United States going to give? You had an attack on Saudi Arabia's oil facilities and half their oil production was stopped for a week. What did Donald Trump do? He said, oops, sorry, I can't do much about it. Packed his bags and ran up. Look at what they did in Vietnam, what they did in Iraq, what they did in Afghanistan. They mm -hmm. packed their bags and run as fast as they can and, and when there is a real uh, crisis. And even after pushing Ukraine to continue with this war, we we, we are already hearing voices in the U.S. Uh, suggesting that Ukraine should now back off. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, I hope... But they, they learn from Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan. Don't put your soldiers' feet on the ground. Yeah, Let I'm... the other guy fight your interest. And that is what they are doing in Ukraine. I feel very sorry for Ukraine, by the way. They yeah. are taking a hammering. Yeah. They are fighting a country several times their size with a very, very substantial military force, second or third in the world. And this tiny country is paying the price for the expansion of NATO. Is this what the whole world is about? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think your point is well made. Like uh, the Iranians signed the JCPOA with uh, with Obama. And then uh, next time, the, the first thing that uh, Donald Trump did was to take away. And then Biden promised to get back into JCPOA. And he has failed to do that. And I think the Saudis, if they don't demand a treaty, which means it is approved by the U.S. Senate, uh, we'll get the same thing. Biden will sign something uh, and then the next president will even I won't be surprised if the next president is a Democrat who might renege on an agreement to Saudi Arabia on security. Well, what capital. is a treaty worth? <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. it is still up to you to decide what yeah. role you will play. That is Treaties true. are couched in general terms. The assessment of the role you will play in a particular situation uh, uh, is decided by the country's concern. You don't have a scenario like the First World War where due to treaty obligations, uh, a kind of minor skirmish in one corner of Europe led to a world war for all those years. <laughs> that kind of scenario, I don't see. The Americans decide to use their military force when it suits their interest. Obviously. Not obviously. Saudi Arabia's interest. Obviously, and they I... use it overwhelming force against a kind of, against an enemy that cannot fight back. You do carpet bombing, kill as many people as possible, and then you back off. You are they have never actually succeeded in terms of their strategic interest in any of the wars that they have fought. Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan being the most obvious examples. Even Iraq, uh, we failed to I mean, one of the remarkable things about U.S. wars, uh, especially in the 21st century, has been that they have not achieved the political goals for which they were fought. So, Ambassador Saab, I want to really thank you for taking so much time. Thank you, very much. Being so frank. Very pleasure to be with you. Yeah, so I request the viewers to definitely download the book uh, once again. Uh, the, I will provide the link to the book, to the PDF, so you can download the entire book. It is free, doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it. I will also provide a separate link uh, to Ambassador Saab's chapter, which is the third chapter in the book. I will also provide a link to... Uh, Ambassador Ahmed's uh, book. Uh, actually, I will connect, link you to his uh, Amazon page where you can look at his other books. This is a very good book for those of you who are interested in the history of the region as well as the diplomatic history of the region. It covers both sides of it. Uh, so, and uh, those of you who have watched conversations but have not subscribed, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, make sure you share it with your friends and your neighbors. And those of you who would like to support the channel, please join the channel and become a member of Conversations. And uh, until next time, this is your host, Muqtadar Khan.